evening, everyone. Uh, as we get going, we have a musical welcome. Uh, Adlai Williams from Bethel AME is going to sing a first, a first verse, verse of Amazing Grace <laughs> to kind of ground us. Uh, so I welcome Adlai. He wanted to sing two verses, and I said he's going to sing one. <laughs> so welcome into the space, and we're going to get going as Adlai sings us. Do 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 was blind, but now I see. Do 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 United Interfaith Actions Housing Community Action Meeting. I am Odette Emanelu, a member of St. Michael's Parish and a board member of UIA for 20 some years and one of the co-chairs for tonight's meeting. Thank you so much for being with us tonight to take action on housing. Thank you for being with us. So we have a full agenda okay, in which we will share some data and personal testimonies okay, for the housing crisis in Fall River. We will hear a housing proposals from a local nonprofit and a developer ready to build. We will hear from local stakeholders who bear witness to the housing challenges. And we will ask our Mayor Coogan to continue to take action. Are we all ready to take action on housing? So housing matters to me because I have seen an hour of agony and suffering regarding housing families and children. Not knowing where you will sleep at night affects everything, your education, your work, your physical and mental health. Let's do more about uh, housing in our city. And with this in mind, I would like to call upon the other co-chair for tonight's meeting, Reverend Jamie Spriggs. So I'm the Reverend Jamie Spriggs. I'm one of your co-chairs tonight. Um, welcome to the First Baptist Church of Fall River. We're so uh, grateful that you have come today. Um, I am so blessed to be pastor of this church. Uh, when I first got here a couple of years ago, I went to lunch down at a diner down the street. And someone said, oh, you're a pastor? You're a pastor of what church? And I said, First Baptist. And I was so grateful. They didn't say, oh, that's the church across from the Y. And they didn't say, oh, that's the brick church on North Main Street. They said, oh, that's the church that helps people. And I thought, praise God, I get to pastor the church that helps people. How awesome is that? But week in and week out, I see people 
who have needs that I can't meet, who need help that a small church like this one can't give. And it breaks my heart to say, no, I can't help you. So I come here tonight hoping that as a community, we can put into place some systems that will help those in need. Amen? Amen. So will you pray with me? Oh, it's not downstairs. I miss, I miss my congregation downstairs. I miss the yes from that. Will you pray with me? Yes. <laughs> there we go. Holy One, we come together in this space because there are people in this community that we love who are struggling to meet their most basic needs. We come together in good faith to hear their stories and to hear the stories of those who have been working to meet their needs. Open our ears to hear, open our hearts to receive, open our minds to engage with what is shared tonight. Grant us wisdom and discernment and love for each other and bless us so that Fall River might become a place where all of your beloved children might have what they need to thrive. We ask this in your most holy name. Amen. Uh, I'd like to introduce one of our UIA leaders, Felix Gonzalez. Good evening, everyone. My name is Felix Gonzalez. Um, I am from San Mary Cathedral and leader of UIA. Tonight, United Interfaith Action is hosting this meeting. UIA was founded in 1996, organizing at the grassroots level to put faith in action for justice in Southwestern Mass. We develop community members into community leaders, putting our values into action for the social, racial, and economic justice we seek. Over the years, UA has fought locally in ways such as increasing offer a school, increasing the offer of school programming, after the school programming, winning the creation of the Shannon Youth Outreach Program in Fall River and working statewide to win an increase in the minimum wage and provide paid family medical leave for all workers in the Commonwealth. UIA current set of issues include education, public safety, immigration, and housing. We welcome you tonight to our housing action. We would like to recognize the congregation of UA who have helped us to organize this meeting tonight. Better AME Church. <laughs> wake up, wake up. St. Luke's Episcopal Church. The Catholic collaboratives of Central Fall River, including the Cathedral of St. Mary. This house is our first Baptist church. Thank you, thank you all for collaborating. We also wanted to uh, welcome uh, elected officials that are with us tonight. Mayor Paul Kugan, welcome. We also want to uh, welcome uh, the state representative, Alan Sylvia, which is with us, will be with us in a couple of minutes, right? Also, if there is any, any other official elected here with us, we welcome you. Thank you for, for your service and for the service in our community. We also welcome you, the community, who has gathered with us tonight for this housing meeting. We are all in action for housing tonight. Now, I would like to introduce our friend, brother, Adley Williams, to 
review the ground rules for this thing. Great evening, everybody. Good evening. Put a smile on your face. Be here to look at housing in ways that be unbelievable, but we can't come together. We're gonna go through the ground rules, all right? They are up on the screen, so let's try to understand it. I'm doing a little bit of kick with it. Okay, we have a time people that's somewhere out there that's gonna let people, you can't talk over your time limit. We'd like for you to respect other people's testimonies because they are real in their life. We have to look about, we are all here if we even disagree, but one thing we can't come on the common ground is we are here for a reason. One reason. Okay? Now, after the service, we're going to have a chance to put your input in it. But let's respect all the questions, the answers, that celebrate, or whatever that's needed at those specific times. Are we okay with that? Yeah. I can't hear nobody. Are we okay with that? Our next speaker will be Reverend Jim Arnold. Thank you. Good evening. Buenas noches. I'm Reverend Jim Hornsby from St. Luke's Church on Warren Street in Fall River. I also participate in the Cambodian Buddhist Temple. We all need a decent place to live. Right now, we face in the city rapidly rising rents, home purchase prices shooting upwards. We simply need more housing, more housing for all people in all areas, all kinds for everyone. But most of the housing that seems to be being built right now seems to be for the more affluent. There is simply not enough affordable housing. Now my definition of affordable is six to eight hundred dollars a month for two bedroom. Investors come and they buy homes, three tenements, multi-families, and sell them at a higher price, or raise the rents and make money. The goal, however, is not usually to provide affordable housing. Homeowners, young ones, particularly, I worry about them. They're being priced out of the market. 600,000 bucks for a cell phone home, and the train is coming. It will put even more demand on housing costs. Today, someone called me for a baptism, and I've known her, baptized her, as a matter of fact, long, several years ago, and she said, my grandson is coming to live with me. You baptize him. Fine. I said, where do you live? She said, I don't know. They raised my rent from 800 to 1400. I don't know where I'm going to be living. A woman six months ago greeted me. Said, they, said much the same thing as she cried at me when she came into church. And she said they're going to take all that I, well, almost all that I have, a thousand dollars. So will she go homeless? Will either one of them live, find a decent place to live? Our city government has done a lot but not enough in the face of this overwhelming, almost overwhelming at least, rapid rise in costs. We need to work on all fronts. 
So we've invited nonprofit developers who'll talk to us, and we'll ask the mayor to spend some money. The city is receiving from federal and state governments, some for direct action, some for seed money, to gain more resources. And what will happen with the women in my story? Will they find decent housing that they can afford? Will they go homeless? Will they stay where they are? Pay all their money for rent. Tonight, we can write new stories with more hope. Let's get to work on it. And Jeff Wells has a whole lot of numbers for us. He's the moderator here at First Baptist Church and our director of community meetings. As Jamie just said, I'm uh, a uh, member here at First Baptist Church. I'm privileged to also be the moderator. And my greatest blessing is that I get to be the director of community meals and head of our feeding ministry where we open our doors on Tuesdays and Thursday nights and feed uh, out 80 meals plus whatever uh, else we can pull from our cabinets uh, for everybody that uh, comes in our door. And it is a uh, privilege uh, to be able to do that. They are the very same people that we are representing tonight. They're the very same people that are asking us for sleeping bags and tents. So in our research, uh, through these past months, we've come up with a lot of information, and we'll see some of it up here on the screen. One of the things is just, and you've already started to hear about it, how severely cost burdened our uh, people are here in Fall River. We have 24% of households in Fall River spending more than half their income on housing. When you do that, there's not enough left for everything else. So we just are asking to find the cost for a place to live is making it hard to live. We're asking to find the ways to bring the, uh, these costs down and to not have these crazy numbers where people cannot afford uh, their rents. We also have huge wait lists for housing. There are currently 500, and these come from uh, our, Fall River, our friends at Fall River Housing, there are currently 689 on Fall River's Section 8 Federal Housing Subdi Subsidy Wait List, 5,689. There are 337 that are on Fall River's uh, MRVP, which is the State Housing Sub Subsidy Wait List. And then there are 4,136 on the city's wait list for public housing. While we realize that there's some of those num numbers duplicate across these lists, there are still thousands of people. Picture this room duplicated hundreds of times down the street that are waiting for housing and wait typically five to six years. I have two more uh, things to share with you. One is the devastating numbers experiencing homelessness. In 2002, when a uh, point in uh, time count was done, we identified there were 361 individuals identified that were either in shelters, transitional housing, or literally living on the streets. And in the Fall River Public Schools, our children, 823 students are actively homeless. That number goes up and down all the time with couch surfing and all the other things that they have to experience to have a place to sleep. Lastly, we just uh, lift up our high rates of eviction and the, and the pressure that that puts upon people. Bristol County has the second highest eviction rate of all counties in Massachusetts. There have been 1,124 since October when the state's eviction moratorium ended. While in comparison to the north at Suffolk County, which includes Boston, has only 698 evictions. Fall River, sadly, and we want to work on this, currently has the highest eviction rate of the cities and towns in Massachusetts, 471 since October 2020, where our, uh, comparatively Brockton, just to the north, a similarly sized city has faced only 193 evictions, less than half of Fall River. 
This data clearly shows the depth of housing issues facing River, Fall River and the need for all of us. These community members that are here are city officials that have come to join us to keep working towards solutions. I just, the last thing I just want to say is yes, those were tons and tons of numbers, but those numbers are people. They are David, they are Eric, they are Jane, they are all the people that we serve downstairs and many, many more. At this time, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Dwayne to give us a uh, testimony. First, I'd like to thank everybody for coming in. Um, my name is Dwayne Dean. I've been a lifelong resident of Fall River. 50 years old, and I'm sh unsure about where I'm going to live at the end of the month. I'm disabled. I live on a social security check. For the last seven years, I paid $550 a month for one bedroom apartment. It leaves me with approximately $300. Was always enough. I've never been a day late on my rent. The question I ask myself is where do I go from here? Rents are astronomical. I don't have first, last, and security. Because, of course, they want that up front. a little stricken and discouraged. When I was a kid, a lot of these places like CFC and the churches helped my family along the way. Kind of had a big family. So, kind of look for the public for a little help. To come up here and speak in front of people, I'm gonna tell you how hard this is. For one, I am the person that a lot of people that I call friends and family call for help. Now here I am. I've spent half my life in prison due to addiction that has put me in places and in situations that my mind and my heart knew that I should have never been in. So for the past 10 years, I've turned my life around. I've become involved with communities, uh, the community places. I mean, things like the Rivers Trust Group. I give my time to places like CFC. I volunteer because I'm not the person that I once was many years ago. So when I was asked to come here and speak, I didn't hesitate. Um, this is possibly one of the hardest things I've ever had to do because I am a very, not so much quiet because I can be loud. <laughs> but a very secluded individual. A lot of 
lot of people look at me and they see the exterior of a guy with a beard, long hair, tattoos, t-shirt. This is my idea of dressing up in a pair of jeans and, of course, a pair of red ones. This is my idea of dressing up. I have um, been asked to come here and share a little bit of my story of what's going on in my life. I have, um, I was told around the beginning of the year that they would be selling my building and somebody just bought it. Stuck like Chuck. Four things in life you need air, food, water, and shelter. I know how to make money the wrong way. I don't want to revert back to anything like that so I can afford a place to live. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dwayne. What a powerful story. Thank you. Now I would like to welcome Madeleine that is going to give us um, some instructions for conversation. All right. <laughs> All right. Can I have everyone to stand, please? Turn to your neighbor. Okay? Now, ask them the question. Why are you here? Discuss this for five minutes and then Odette will bring this up. Okay? But discuss, why are you here? Can we have a seat so we continue with the agenda, please? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right, we are back. So it feels good uh, to know that we're not alone. So when you were talking to the person next to you, even if you were not going through the housing crisis, I know for sure that you know somebody that is going through. So for many of us, the housing crisis seems too big to tackle. Yet, we all had conversations about why housing matters to us. And if each one of us is willing to take action along with our officials, we can do something about this crisis. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. This afternoon, we are going to hear us using the term ARPA, the American Rescue Plan Act. This is COVID recovery money of the federal government for our state and our cities and towns. Did you know that the federal government gave the state of Mass five billion dollars of ARPA funds for COVID recovery? In Portuguese, we say COVID. <laughs> Can you imagine the zeros on those five billion dollars? And the Mass State Legislature has already designated one billion of that five billion, in which is 20 percent, 
towards housing in this year, meaning this past year. One billion dollars for housing in mass. We want some of those funds for housing here in Fall River, don't we? The city has funds to use as well. UIA has asked the mayor, our mayor, Kogan, to increase our spending to address the housing crisis. UIA also wants to see Fall River increase city spending on housing with programs such as Community Preservation Act and Community Development Block Grants. We are asking 10 million more in housing spending from ARPA and other city funds. So do you think that 10 million will make a change for housing in our city? Yes. Mm. We are offering some proposals tonight and what could be done with 10 million. I welcome Janice Happy and Jeff Walls to talk about this issue. Good evening, everyone. I am Janice Happy, a member of St. Mary's Cathedral and a volunteer of the Fall River Public School, as well as leader of UIA. We received feedback from community members as how 10 million could be used to address housing in our city. Can you see our proposals on the screen and in your agenda packet? The first ever response is housing stabilization for renters. The city could expand an emergency housing fund of rental subsidies of one million to help those who are facing immediate eviction or for those who do not qualify for state assistance, but are still at risk for losing their housing. The city could also establish a legal service fund with 500,000 to hire additional lawyers to represent renting and eviction cases. The Southeast Housing Court continues to have the highest eviction in Mass. With the lowest rate of legal represent, representation for renters, this is unacceptable, right? Yeah. right? We will now hear a housing testimony from Luciana Medeiros. <laughs> Good afternoon, my name is Luciana Medeiros. I am a wife and a mother of two children. Two, son, two children. A questão das casas tem sido primeiro dia para toda a minha família, especialmente para as minhas crianças. The issue of housing has been an agony for my family, especially for my children. Antes deste apartamento onde estamos a viver agora, before the before this the apartment that we are residing now, andávamos de um lado para o outro com a casa às costas. We would go from place to place with a house in our backs. E debaixo de muito sacrifício, de muitos chuvos, conseguimos onde estamos. But under a lot of sacrifice and pride, we were able to get the place where we are now. Uh, os, os donos são muito bons. The landlords are very nice people. Embora que a renda da casa não, não seja alta. Well, even though the rent is not that high, O pagamento é sempre muito duro. But the payment for the rent is always an incredible suffering. 
antes da, da pandemia, Before the pandemic, eu e o meu marido my trabalhava. My husband, we worked for a week. Com a pandemia, sim. O câncer que tem não pode estar a trabalhar assim muitos dias. With the pandemic, illness came to our family. And we cannot be working for a week. E fez tudo por água abaixo. And everything went down with the water. Os trabalhos desapareceram, as doenças chegaram. The jobs disappeared and all the illness to my husband and myself failed. If it was not for UIA, to helping us with the payment, with the rent payment, com as minhas crianças. I would be on the street with my children. Graças a Deus, a organização como a UIA tem uma história. Thanks be to God to who I am. That has been helping us. Que Deus nos abençoe a todos. God bless all of you. Thank you, Luciana, for your moving story. We are here for you and your family. Your story, in addition to many others, I know, including my own family, is the reason I'm here tonight, to take action on housing. So what, excuse me, so what else could $10 million do to address our housing crisis in the city? In addition to funds to support renters, and the city should use more funds to create more affordable housing for low to moderate income families. With five million, the city could provide seed money to the community organization invested in creating affordable housing. Tonight, we will hear from one of these organizations ready to build The city could also create a Fall River Affordable Housing Development Fund. This fund can be used for the purchase, rehabilitation, and development costs of creating housing. This type of fund signals to the state that affordable housing is a priority, which opens the door for more funds to come into our city. Remember, the state has allocated $1 billion for housing and it's ready to match city funding for housing. I now introduce Jeff Waltz to present our final two ways that 10 million could make a positive impact on housing in our city. Jeff. As we seek to figure out ways to, uh, for this $10 million ask and break, break it out in different uh, sections, I do have the last two. Understand that we want to work and figure out where this money could be spent. But here are two more uh, places. The city could use one million to increase funding for its first time home buyers program. I have one more piece of data that was handed to me just last night, which is that in 2017, the median income housing uh, house price in Fall River was 208,000. And in just five years, in four years, it is now 295. It is almost at 300,000. In that short time, that's a 29% increase and sends it off so that uh, fewer and fewer people are able to become those first time home buyers. That we want those people to buy their homes. We want more people in Fall River to be housing stable. So that's where we'd like a million dollars to go. The city could also use two and a half million to provide the wraparound services which are essential in successful housing programs. We've recognized in our research again that yes, we can house people and we can, uh, that process does work. 
but we also need to then support the person afterwards. There are so many issues that wrap around someone that uh, reaches uh, an issue, the issue of homelessness. And we just want to see enough money and enough attention to all the other pieces that come into play when we have uh, someone that is homeless. And so with that, we have talked about the $10 million. I now will welcome Chris Gaudiello to offer our final housing testimony. Christopher Gaudiello. I'm here tonight to share my housing story. I work as a recovery coach at Riverton Recovery on Pleasant Street, and I'm also a fast response team and street outreach member. I work an organization embedded in the police department to help with um, substance use, overdose, overdose uh, prevention, mental illness, uh, sorry, mental illness disorder, and also homelessness. Well, I'm in a good place in life today. This was not always the case. About 11 years ago, I was living in an apartment in Fall River with my partner, three children, and a fourth child on the way. A new tenant came into our building, and bed bugs became a serious problem throughout the building. We complained to the landlord and stopped paying rent until the problem was addressed. But instead of fixing the problem, everybody in the building was evicted just like that. We had no place to go, and me and my family of five, including the baby on the way, were homeless, living in the Toyota Corolla for an entire summer. It took a while to find a place, and I can't, can't even imagine trying to go through that and search for a place now in those same circumstances. At the time, we were paying around between seven and eight hundred a month for a family of five. But the places we lived in were typically in poor condition, with the landlord not willing to fix anything or take care of the property. You say we went through some pretty difficult years, battling addiction along with the housing challenges we faced. But a few years ago, with the help of community service, community <coughs> services, I got clean and found stable housing in places like Catholic Social Services. Now, me and my fiance worked, and we saved enough money to went through a first-time home buyers program. And we bought our own home two years ago. Now working as a recovery coach, as part of the city's outreach, street outreach team, I'm able to give back what was so freely given to me. Moving from a housing crisis to housing stability and even home ownership is possible. It takes an entire community of support to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. How do those stories make you feel? They hit your heart. Yeah. Um, those were only three stories I can tell you uh, because I know so many people in this room that there are a lot of other stories. I promise I won't call any of you up, but I could literally pick people out of the pews and have them come up and tell you their stories, which would also hit your heart um, in exactly the same way. There were so many stories in this room. Who here knows someone who is struggling with housing right now? Everyone in the room, right? Who here believes that the city should dedicate $10 million of this once in a lifetime ARPA money to address the housing shortage in Fall River? Yeah. Tonight we have two nonprofit organizations who have experience creating affordable housing and who are ready to take action in Fall River, if we'll have them. I welcome Jim Sewell and Aaron Bornstein to come up front. Uh, Jim is first, he is the president of the Preservation Society of Fall River, which is one of our local community housing development organizations. And Andrea has been very strict to tell me that both of you have two minutes. <laughs> thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you. 
you know, from the Preservation Society of Fall River, we're a non-profit organization. Uh, everyone on my board is a uh, volunteer, including myself. The whole, we're all volunteer. Uh, most people think of us as uh, a gentrification organization because we're out trying to save beautiful historic homes and what use have we got there when we're talking about affordable housing tonight. But the fact is, we actually do affordable housing also. Uh, and uh, I'm going to turn the page here. I changed my speech over to match what the questions were up there before. Why does housing matter? Uh, what we think is two top things. It's humanitarian. We need good affordable housing. Two, we need to balance middle and upper income with lower income. A good community needs a balance. You can't have it one side or the other. It doesn't quite work. You can see Boston doesn't work. Or I think actually has more potential than Boston now. But we need a good balance. Why am I here tonight? I'm here to show you that some good is being done. We have created some affordable housing and we can do more. We can show that better development can be done because that's what we do. If you see the properties we have done, they stand out. They are much better than most properties you'll see developed. And the last thing, uh, for better quality, uh, uh, what do we want to change? We want to change, we want to see better quality affordable housing. And we can do that. We have that formula. And we want to see housing that improves neighborhoods. So the, the, the development has to actually improve the neighborhoods. We have done that, and we have proven that. And we want housing that allows people to live in dignity. Thank you so much. That was perfect, and it was under the two minutes. I'm, I'm really impressed. <laughs> Um, our next speaker is Aaron Gorenstein, who is president and CEO of POA, which is the Preservation of Affordable Housing. It's a national nonprofit that's working to preserve, create, and sustain affordable housing. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. I'm head of POA, and we really work to create and preserve affordable homes over the long term. We're not interested in selling our properties. We want to keep them up, keep them for future generations, and keep them affordable. We work closely with the community in which we, in which we um, own properties to ensure that our properties are well designed and meet local needs. And we always work in partnership with community-based organizations and the city government. We own and manage properties in this region, including in New Bedford. Uh, for example, we're now expanding our Temple Landing property to include new housing for low-income seniors. But one of our goals is to help the families who live in our properties to achieve economic mobility. We do that by offering them supports and financial coaching. We run the largest family self-sufficiency program of any multifamily owner in the country. After three years of participating in this program, our residents save an average of $8,000 and increase their earnings by more than 50%. This often enables them, it's an amazing program, it often enables them to buy their first home with that down payment, they clean up their credit, they reduce their debt, and then their apartment is freed up for the next family on the waiting list. We don't require that, but that's often the outcome. Now to finish up, as former Undersecretary for Housing for Governor Deval Patrick, I know the importance of having local funding matched by state and federal resources. And I also want to point out that the state does allow a local preference to ensure that Fall River or any other community can tailor their development to local needs. So we welcome the opportunity to work with you and others in any way we can to help meet your local affordable housing needs. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you, John and Aaron, vice versa. Okay for offering concrete ways we can continue 
okay, to take action and create housing opportunities in our city. The next part of our meeting, okay, we raise up voices from additional stakeholders in our community who support increased funding to address housing in Fall River. We need support not only from the mayor and developers, but also from community members. And at this point, I would like uh, to call upon, okay, representing Bay Coast, I would like to call Julie Gagliardi. From CFC, I would like to call Elizabeth, okay, Barabi and Crystal Arpa, that's her last name, Arpa. And from the First Baptist Church, okay, Reverend James, okay, Spriggs. Thank you. <clears throat> Bakos Bank's mission is to provide exceptional service and solutions to our customers and the communities we serve. We do that, of course, through our banking and associated services, but also through our community engagement. Our employees are actively engaged in nonprofit and community organizations throughout the South Coast. And we provide nearly $3 million annually to organizations and initiatives that address key issues, such as housing. In the area of housing, we've provided startup grants and ongoing support for organizations such as Stepping Stone, First Step In, Solomon's Porch. We've supported the annual Homeless Connect Summit in both Fall River and New Bedford. Our president and CEO, along with Dan Long, who's here with me from Bacos Mortgage, have been active members of the Mayor's Homeless Tax Force for years. We provided annual operating grants to Community Action for Better Housing, and recently, we, we provided a grant to the Fall River Historical Society, I'm sorry, yeah, Preservation Society, and the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth Law School to fund interns who, work, who will work alongside South Coast legal services attorneys and local housing advocates to assist Fall River residents. We've made these investments in time and funding because we see housing both as a crit critical community issue and as a business concern. We have heard today how housing has become an even more critical issue for our region, and especially in gateway cities like Fall River and New Bedford. Just as we believe that education, job opportunities, and even a vibrant arts and culture sector are vital to economic growth, the availability or lack thereof of affordable workforce housing is crucial for that growth and it's important for a community's overall health. As a regional community bank with over 500 employees, it is important that our employees have access to affordable housing in order for them to do what they do, raise a family, give back to the community, and have a rewarding life. Bay Coast Bank's commitment to work with community leaders like those here today, and organizations like you have heard from, to address these issues, we, we believe it's the right thing to do. I'm not sure of the answers, although we've heard some today, but I believe that our mission, along with our experience so far, and our past success in working alongside key stakeholders to address issues related to educational attainment and arts and culture, lead us to want to be at the table here with all of you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Liz Barabi, the Executive Director at Citizens for Citizens Incorporated, the community action agency serving over 30,000 individuals within the greater Fall River and Taunton area. Our mission is to advocate on behalf of those less fortunate and try to lift people out of poverty and gain some type of financial stability by the programs we run and by referring to other social service agencies within our community. The most known programs we offer are our Head Start and Child Care programs, Fuel Assistance and Weatherization, our Food Pantry, Operation Christmas, and a Small Rental Assistance Program, which we fund normally through FEMA and other small grants. During the pandemic, CFC used our CARES funds and paid over $250,000 directly to landlords, trying to get clients caught up on rent to prevent, ev to prevent eviction and homelessness along with providing wraparound services. CFC is committed to working with the city and other agencies in trying to help sell, solve some of the issues 
that seem to be haunting our low to moderate income residents? Does CFC have the answer? No. But we are willing to help come up with short and long-term solutions and help craft assistance programs to do so. I would like to thank the United Interfaith Action for including CFC in the conversation and the opportunity to share our concerns with you today. We also support UIA proposal to allocate additional emergency rental assistance with the OPA funds the city has. I would like to hand it over to Crystal Opera to continue to speak on behalf of our CFC clients. Hi, I am Crystal Offer. I am the Community Resource Director at Citizens for Citizens. I have been running our rental program for a little over 17 years now. And since the pandemic, it is the most heartbreaking thing I have seen and done in my career. In the past year, since the pandemic hit, many homes have been sold. At a very high rate, most of the clients coming to me at this time cannot afford their new rent. The rent for a studio apartment has gone from $600 to over $1,400. Somebody on SSI or Social Security, they cannot make ends meet with those rents. A waiting list for Section 8 is running eight years. It is three to five years waiting list to going to public housing. Most of my clients have 30 to 60 days to get out of their house at this time. They don't have time for an eight year waiting list. I don't have the answers today. I can't stand here and tell you that I know what the best thing for all these people are. What I can tell you is there's a problem. It is causing depression in many of my clients. They come to me, they're crying, and they don't know what to do. They're elderly people who have worked their whole lives. They are immigrants who have fought to be here. And they are families with young children who now don't know where to turn. I stand before you today not because these people are just my clients. They are my family, they are my colleagues, they are my friends. And I would like to be able to help them. First Baptist Church has a long history of um, a clothing ministry and a feeding ministry uh, to work in the community. Um, we feed 80 meals twice a week, 160 meals a week. When I see these people, summer, spring, fall, winter, so many of them are not only housing insecure but are homeless. We have expanded so that we have started giving sleeping bags and tents and coats and socks and hand warmers and gloves and tarps to people in Fall River who are homeless. I regularly have people for whom there is no room at the shelter or who do not meet the Fall River ID requirements in order to enter First Step Shelter. Last winter, on the night when it was going to be six degrees for the first time, I had a number of homeless folks to whom I gave tents and sleeping bags and the like, who cried because I gave them a tent and a sleeping bag. It breaks my heart that human beings would cry because a sleeping bag and a tent makes the difference between life and death in six degree weather. First Baptist is involved in this action because I want to stop giving sleeping bags and tents to people. Instead, I want them to have real shelter with a place to sleep and a bathroom and a kitchen, a place that they can begin to grow their lives again. That's why First Baptist is involved in the housing action. Thank you again to uh, all our community uh, stakeholders. We need and appreciate your support in this crucial work.
we now turn to what the city can do to continue to address for housing and homelessness. We want to first acknowledge what the city is already doing. We want to thank Mayor Kurgan for his commitment to housing. We appreciate that you are hands on mayor who cares deeply for this city. You travel the city looking for properties that could be developed into affordable housing. You are on the streets and in the shelters speaking to those who are homeless. Mike Dion, who is the director of the Community Development Agency in your office, also puts much energy and time into developing housing solutions in our city. We also want to acknowledge that the city is spending two housing-specific funds from the state called HOME, an emergency solutions grant. Also, the city has received and will be spending four millions in home ARPA funds in the coming year. The city is working on housing and we acknowledge. Thank you. Yet, as we have heard tonight, there is much more that can and should be done. Mr. Mayor, I have some questions. <laughs> All right, I'm scared. <laughs> on this common goal? Uh-huh. Well, I have to just make a few things clear before we start to answer these specific questions. But I want people to understand that when they say uh, the state got $5 billion, or Fall River got $80 million, or this and that, this money came at a price that was absolutely devastating. We lost over 400 people in Fall River, 30,000 people sick, businesses still closed, people out of their houses, people not allowed to go out, restaurants shut down, hospitals overrun. I mean, during the height of this, I was at UMass Dartmouth looking at a satellite hospital to be set up. This was not money that came to us from the clouds. This was money to repair a horrible hurt that went on across this whole Bristol County and to say, well, you received, no, we didn't receive this. We earned this with blood, sweat, and tears in the city. And I want people to understand that the cost this city paid were devastating to a number of people and not just in the housing sector. So let's make sure we keep our eye on the ball where this money's coming from. This money is trying to help people right now that are still overrun with mental health issues, substance abuse, homelessness, housing, these issues are still pouring down the highway on us, and we have a lot of work to do. But I do want to make one thing perfectly clear. I am extremely proud of what goes on in this city. I, I mean, I listen to Jim Sewell, I listen to Crystal. I've been going to CFC for a long time for their Christmas programs. These people reach out to help others. Jim works with us before this began. Jim and I were standing there talking about potential houses and houses to come on. This morning, I met with the gentleman that was, uh, or was it yesterday, that's redoing the houses, um, the apartments on South Main Street, across from Harry's Restaurant. We were making sure the number of housing, affordable units that were going in there were gonna be set. And we've done this time and time again on every piece of property. So don't take your eye off the ball. Fall River is a big city, it needs a lot of help, and we're gonna work together. But I am extremely proud of Fall River. And I'm not going to say anything bad about the city. So what's my first question? <laughs> um, 
love it, yeah. So um, we've been working with Mayor Coogan in recent months so much that I think I heard you quip that you see us more than your family. Um, Not so that bad yet. <laughs> <laughs> We're heading that way. The clock is slowly moving. We'll um, uh, we are grateful that we've been working with you, and from our discussion with the mayor, we're pleased to announce that he has been working on expanding the Fall River shelter capacity to 50 beds year-round. We've been talking about amending the Fall River ID requirement for shelter admission. Okay, on that one, we do have some work to do, okay? Since my conversation with UIA, I followed up on that. ID requirement. The ID requirement is so that we can do a quarry check on the individual coming into us. It's not just exclusionary because of address. So for example, just because someone may have been down on their luck, there's no reason they have to be next to an arsonist, a violent criminal, a pedophile. Those are the things we look at the ID for. I got this information from Stepping Stone after, because I'm very, I, I'm saying, oh, because someone has an ID from a different town, we tell them to take a hike. They said, that's not the reason. We want to make sure the people coming into the shelter are going to be able to cooperate with the other residents and the staff and not cause a disruption. So and that I, will work then absolutely. on figuring out how to address right. that need but also allow those who would be able to, who need shelter to get Right, shelter. again, it's, 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 it's a very tight, uh, tight rope walk you have to do, but at the same time, people come first and we have to help them, but we can't, in one case, be helping people and hurting someone else, so we gotta be careful with that. So we've been working on, on so we, we have been working on and we'll continue working on where the line is, it right. needs to be in a different place than it is now. Well, and, and for example, just so you know, last year we had some really, really cold days. You know, as uh, the Reverend described, six, 10, 11 degrees. We never filled up our overflow shelter. We never filled up our overflow shelter. We had 30 beds down there, and I think the max was 17. And that shelter is very, very nice because we have a separate area for women and a separate area for men. But Mayor Kids. Kitchen, the people that I had that I was serving in that six degree weather didn't have a Fall River ID, so they okay. were not able to pass the requirements in order to get into the overflow shelter. I'm gonna make one more requ request. Please let me finish my question, and then you can make a statement because I don't think jumping in while the other person's talking is gonna allow people to know what's going on in the room. It's kind so of my job. <laughs> well, you can talk then, but if you want me to answer a question, yeah. unless she puts up the time thing, I'd like to be able to answer it. And you can do a time thing on me, I'll stop. Okay? But again, the problem is we were not full. So if we can get these people into a shelter, nobody, we lost two people last year that literally froze to death. They froze to death. They couldn't get into a shelter because of some substance abuse issues and some people because they chose a different path. But I don't know what you do with these people. We, we have the first outreach team in the city's history. A policeman, a program director, two caseworkers. I think this gentleman's one of them. We send them right into the camps, go under the bush, bring the people in. This guy's got a tremendously difficult job, but this is the first time we've reached out aggressively to try to engage these people and get them food, clothing, and shelter, which is what we're all talking about. And we're gonna expand that if we have to, because I do not want to hear one more person freezing to death in the city of Fall River. Amen. It's absolute lunacy. Amen. Our question to you is, will you, can, will you meet with members of the UIA in the fall to update us on the progress uh, with these areas? Expanding the fall, shelter, fall River shelter capacity to 50 beds year round, not just in the winter. Amending the Fall River ID requirement, not entirely deleting it, but amending it uh, to, uh, um, uh, amending that requirement for shelter admission. 
and updating a housing production plan, um, looking into creating a master plan for housing. Will you continue to meet with members of the UIA and in the fall update us on your progress? Well, we'll see how the rest of the meeting goes. <laughs> we'll answer that question at the end. How's that? That's an answer. Go ahead. That was the softball. <laughs> that was the softball answer. <laughs> okay. Thank you for your response. I would like to welcome uh, back to a question. What is Reverend Jim? It's right there. Reverend Jim? <laughs> Inclusionary zoning. Um, inclusionary zoning is another way to get more affordable housing for Fall River. It's a law or an ordinance. The city council would pass. The mayor would have to, in my judgment, would have to support it um, because. He has a lot of influence, or you have a lot of influence. I'm going to start talking to the mayor at this point. When a for-profit developer builds market-rate housing, it's always at high rents or sales price. Inclusionary zoning is, in effect, a requirement that at least 10% of the units be at affordable rents or home prices, or, or if the private developer doesn't want to do that, they can pay into a housing development fund that they can use to create affordable housing elsewhere. Now, Quincy, which is about Fall River's size, adopted this, this law 20 years ago. The developers claimed it would stop housing development. It didn't. So much was done that Quincy's gotten 552 affordable housing units from this law. It's about 50, that's uh, 20, uh, 25 a year. Developers still make big money. They do. Um, but they pay back a little, the city. Uh, the question to you, Mr. Mayor, is can UIA meet with, can we meet, we, UIA, because uh, I would meet with your staff person, Mike Dion, to study inclusionary zoning, and then meet again in the fall to talk some more about it. And we may be talking to city councilors along the way. Your turn. <laughs> Thank you. That was a very good question. Inclusionary zoning was put in because some towns and cities were not meeting the 10% threshold for affordable housing. So those towns were directed or chose to go through an ex exclusion, inclusionary, what is it, inclusionary zoning so they could get more housing in. Fall River is not in that situation. In Fall River, approximately 27% of all of our housing is affordable or has something attached to it. If you look at our neighboring communities, which are all supposed to be at a minimum of 10%, you look at Westport, 4.5%. You look at Somerset, 3.7%. Swansea, 3.9%. Freetown, 26 the state law that guides our communities to go to a 10% threshold was chosen by the legislator and our housing specialists so that everybody took responsibility for some of their neighbors. That's how the law was written. Everybody's supposed to be at 10% so that the community, Bristol County, Massachusetts, raises all the boats together. But these other towns have chosen to go a different path. So my answer to Reverend Hornsby and the UIA is, Go to those towns, advocate for inclusionary zoning, get them to change their regulations so that they pick up some of this housing. I just read a story in the Standard Times about, uh, I think it's Rochester and uh, Mattapoisett. They are they're bringing in additional housing to go to 10%. You know who's going to go into that housing? Residents from New Bedford. Because there's not a lot of low-income people in Mattapoisett or Rochester. So they're going to build housing to accommodate people from New Bedford so that New Bedford's 
numbers go down a little bit, but everybody floats up together. And that should be, the, that should be our housing goal, that as a community, as a county, we all rise and fall together, not intense population zones in a city that's already way over the numbers required. And again, thank you for the question. I think that's a good answer, and I disagree with some of it, but I appreciate where you're coming from, and if we, I once asked this Chehet Selectman in Somerset, as I gave out awards in a book ceremony for graduates, and everyone was white, I said, how come? And do you have any people that are poor? He says, no. Well, the poverty rate in Somerset used to be about 6%. So we do need to work on all of these, and I think you'll support that. Well, thank you. Thank you. Now, we, we turn to the questions about funding, okay, that are funds that can be used to address housing in our city. The city of Fort Beaver has received $64 million in city ARPA funds uh, and $17 million in Bristol County ARPA funds, some of which is still to be allocated. So far, nothing of ARPA has done towards housing. The city should be spend more state and local funds, such as the Community Preservation Act and the Community Development Block Grants on Housing. The city is required to spend at least 10% of CPA funds on housing. For, for uh, 2023, so far, there are no funds for housing projects. And in 22, there was only one housing project uh, funded. For a CDBG, the city spends uh, between 3 to 7 percent of the CDBG funds on housing. We, we acknowledge the CDG money as funded very important programs in our city, such as senior uh, centers, recreation, uh, policy, and fire department. Uh, given the crisis in housing, we think housing is just as critical a need. The city has choices on how to spend these funds, and we want housing to be prioritized more in the city's funds choices. Remember, for Fall River, we get more of the one billion the state has designated for housing. The city needs to put up money too, and to show affordable housing is a priority. Mr. Mayor, we have outlined five areas where we would like to see housing funding be allocated. Number one, the creation and renovation of affordable housing, including the development of New Better Housing Develop Fund, expanding the city's first time home buyer program. Three, expanding emergency rental assistance programs. Four, hiring additional legal representation for the Southeast Housing Court. And number five, developing additional support of housing for those experience, okay, homelessness. And so our question, would you commit to at least an additional 10 million for housing in the city? With funding to come uh, from these proposed areas, the CPA, GDBG, and the ARPA money. Is it possible for you to answer as yes or no? Well, I most certainly can. Uh, right now, right now, today, the city has $4.9 million of home and ARP funding to develop affordable housing. Okay. Right now, half of the 10 million she's talking about is already available. Um, I was on the phone today with Catholic Social Services. Um, the city has approximately another 1.8 million. So let's call the 4.95 and let's call the 1.8, one and a half. So we're already at six and a half million dollars for emergency rental assistance. 
to get people into some kind of housing, like this gentleman was talking about. We, we, we asked if he had been to Catholic Social Services when we were sitting there, and they had not seen him yet to help him with the serious rent issue he's going to be facing. Um, that's money available right now. In Massachusetts, there are six housing courts where people get free legal help if they're running into an eviction or they're running into a problem. Um, in Southeast is the only court in the state without a free legal clinic right in the courthouse. So for some reason we got shunted to the side on that. As far as what goes on, Jim Sewell, who I was so glad you brought up because I do count him as a good friend of mine, the money he's using to develop properties in Fall River is coming from this pool you're talking about. He's already accessing it. He and I were just having a discussion about his building behind the Y and how his June Street project is coming. And Jim knows that when he comes to us with the viable, workable project, we're going to help him. I looked at the list today um, of, of new rents and, pro and, and apartments we put on. The curtain lofts, we added 11 units that are affordable. Knitting mills, 11 units. Three units on Bradford Avenue that Mike did a veterans housing. Donnelly Street, three more units. Murray Street, three more units. June Street, three more units. We're not, not doing affordable housing. We're just bringing it up, working with developers like Jim Sewell. That's what we're doing right now. Yesterday, it's funny to see Julie up here talking because yesterday we were sitting in Bay Coast Bank. Yesterday, talking about a housing project that we think could make an impact in the city. That's what we do. I'm not over here saying, oh, no, 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 no. We're trying to expand it in a calm, rational way. Uh, and I want people to understand that. We're not closing any, any doors on any project or any funding. We're doing that right now. And there is money available right now. Jim takes advantage of it. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. But there is money available right now, and we can work with you. And, and for our rental assistance, we just talked about adding money to that. So we're not opposed to helping people across this city. Don't leave here with some notion that this isn't going to be help. We're going to help every person where they are. You know, before I came here tonight, you know where I was? Massasoit Playground uh, down on Quickershan Street because uh, Mike... Uh, and, and CDA money, redevelop that whole playground, take a ride by it. Beautiful basketball court, a splash pad, a playground. This is about the livability of a city. And we're all wanting to make Fall River more livable. All of us. It's just where your priorities are. And I don't want to, I don't want to lose people to ridiculous housing costs, costs. But this is a statewide, nationwide problem that we're in the throes of, just like COVID, and we are going to work our way out of it. That's all we can do. And I know it's almost 8 o'clock, and if you listen to me much longer, I know you'll jump, so I'm sorry. <laughs> I, do, I do want to say one thing before I go. I do want to thank um, Representative Sylvia for coming down tonight. He and I have worked on a number of projects together related to affordable housing. It is a heavy lift. I know the other guys would have been here, but I know they're probably busy, but he, he cut some time out to come by because he knew this was an important debate, and I want to thank him for being here. And I do want people to know, you keep hearing the name Mike Dion. Mike's sitting in the front with me. I want you to understand something. Mike and I fight a lot, and we work together a lot. because <laughs> We're trying to make the city a better place to live, and that's what you have to understand. And again, I talked way too much. My wife's going to kill me, but I appreciate you all coming out tonight. Thank you very much. So tonight we've heard some heartbreaking stories and we've heard statistics that stem from and speak to the housing crisis that we're experiencing. And we've heard from some nonprofit organizations who have expertise in building affordable housing and supportive services for the homeless and for the housing insecure. And we've heard from Bay State Bank, who supports those efforts. Thank you. Um, we've heard from the mayor, uh, who I think has agreed to continue working on these issues. <laughs> and who, who may or may 
not um, have said I won't shut the door on that ten million you've asked for. So if if the uh, if there are good housing proposals that come forward for that ten million dollars, we will consider those proposals. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, he will talk about considering proposals to use that ARPA money. I think that's where we are, folks. Look, this is a complex problem, and it can't be solved just by City Hall, and it can't just be solved by just nonprofits, and it can't even be just solved by our friends at Bay State, uh, much as we love them. Um, it needs all of us to address this issue all of us to raise our voices and say this is something we care about, all of us to work toward making a better future for Fall River, yes? yes. <laughs> so what can you do? There's an information packet, and on the back of that packet, there should be um, an interest form. You can just rip it off the back of your packet, and if you would fill it out for us and put it in the basket in the back, it will ask you if you are interested in housing. It will also ask you about the other um, issues that UIA is interested in, such as that is working in, such as education, immigration, public safety, and voter engagement. So please fill out those forms. There are pens in, on the front of the pews in, uh, in front of you. And Burdell, our usher extraordinaire, has pens if you need them. He's standing in the aisle. Please fill those out and we will contact you um, to talk about how you can continue your interest in those forms. Um, I've asked at the last minute, I appreciate you, John, from uh, Emmanuel Casa de Gracia. Uh, to come up and offer the closing prayer. He will do so in Spanish. Um, I believe we have an English translation also coming up front. Thank you so much. So, God bless you all. Then. Um, I want to say something. I believe in the great power of God. And I know that nothing is impossible for him. We are the voice to, aid, to be able to build a great city. And it all begins by doing small things that make difference. So let's pray. Um, demos gracias a Dios. <laughs> and thank God. <laughs> yeah, I try, I try, but. <laughs> All right. Señor, te doy gracias. God, I give you thanks. Por tu amor y tu misericordia. For your love and, yeah. and your mercy. So, te damos gracias. Te damos gracias, Señor, por tu amor y tu misericordia. Gracias por permitirnos estar aquí reunidos. Creemos en ti, creemos en tu poder. Y aunque sabemos que nuestra ciudad está pasando por momentos difíciles, nosotros creemos que tú eres el arquitecto por excelencia, que puedes, Señor amado, organizar todo y proveer paz, seguridad en todo hogar que en este momento lo necesita. Yo te pido, Dios, que seas tú tomando el control. Tú eres quien abre puertas, tú eres quien cierra puertas. Y creemos, Señor, que nada es imposible para ti. Todas las cosas son posibles cuando podemos creer. Gracias te damos. Porque, porque veremos en esta ciudad una gran ciudad creada bajo la paz, el amor, y sobre todo, and above all else, tu gracia. Well, thanks for you. Gracias por todo. Thank you for everything. En el nombre de Jesús te pedimos. In the name of uh, Jesus, Amen. we thank you. Amen. Amen. Amen.